Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the JobKeeper Extension All You Need to Know webinar. My name is Andrew Helley, a partner manager here at Reckon, and I'll be hosting today's webinar. I wanted to start by thanking you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us this morning. The session should run for approximately an hour. If you do experience any audio issues during the presentation, please refer to the phone dial-in preferences located on the GoToWebinar control panel. And due to the large number of attendees, we won't be taking any live questions this morning. I'm very excited to introduce our presenter today, industry leader Clayton Oates from QA Business. Here at Reckon, our focus is empowering Australian small businesses, and we're thrilled to work with wonderful partners like Clayton to bring you valuable and educational content. Clayton, a Reckon accredited partner, is a passionate and engaging communicator who speaks around Australia and internationally in a practical style based on his 30 plus years of accounting and business experience. I'll now hand over to you, Clayton, and let's get started. Well, thank you so much, Andrew, for that introduction and welcome everybody. Um, as Andrew said, we've got a lot to get through here today. Um, yeah, it may be an hour, it may be a few minutes over an hour. We've tried to pack more in as things have sort of developed over the past few days um, as well here. So the JobKeeper Extension webinar, helping you get up to speed on JobKeeper 2.1. The, the extension of JobKeeper, and also covering off on changes to JobKeeper 1.0, the original JobKeeper that finishes in, a, in the 27th of September. So why this webinar? I mean, the purpose really is to help you gain some clarity. It's been incredibly uh, confusing for a lot of people, even advisors, you know, ourselves as advisors have had to do a lot of, lot of research to find out what are all the components of JobKeeper, both the original JobKeeper, but also the extension. So we've tried to distill this as much as possible into a sort of a clear um, descriptive session that we're gonna run through today. Get you up to speed on um, the key changes, the things that have changed to JobKeeper 1.0, the original JobKeeper, Talk a lot about the extension that's happening now. I imagine most of you are here for that purpose, to find out how does this extension happen? Um, do I qualify? And what are the things I need to do to make sure that I'm compliant? We'll also look at uh, utilising your software to help review for your eligibility. Uh, throughout the whole session, we'll put in as many relevant and practical tips as possible around things that we've sort of discovered over the last six months of JobKeeper, but particularly in the last few weeks around uh, JobKeeper extension. We'll also refer to you as, to as many resources and references as possible. I know a lot of you on the call today are small to medium sized business owners and operators, um, but also accountants and bookkeepers, you know, that are trying to help your clients and uh, there's been so much information to sort through. So we'll try and give you as many references as possible to sort of give you that cut through. Uh, we'll also tackle the common frequently asked questions throughout the session as well. So JobKeeper 1.0, what's changed? We'll do an overview, um, even though uh, it's just about finished, but there's a lot of things that are relevant to JobKeeper 1.0 that'll flow through to the extension. Uh, there was also an announcement extension JobKeeper 2.0. It was a bit of a false start, we'll talk about that. Um, but the lion's share of the session is all about the extension JobKeeper 2.1. It is going ahead and it's about to start. So who qualifies for the extension? Um, how do you assess your eligibility? We'll use the Reckon software as a case study around that. We'll also look at the new subsidy rates, the rates have changed. And we'll also look at what's required to be changed in your software. There are software changes um, that have only just been announced. And where to get more help, where to find out additional information, but also get more help and support uh, beyond this webinar. So if I go back one step, first of all, is the important question is how are you holding up? You know, it's been an incredibly challenging six months. It's hard to believe that it's been six months. It feels like six years uh, since COVID actually hit us all. And for many, you know, it's been probably the most challenging time of our lives in business. So it's okay to feel a bit overwhelmed and that's quite normal. Um, one of the things we've found the most sort of the clients that are sort of coping the best through this um, challenging situation is that they're, they're checking in with others. They're actually, um, you know, opening up communication. Advisors are opening up communication with their clients or clients are actually talking to their advisors. Um, importantly though, check in with yourself, you know, be kind to yourself, um, be kind and understanding, you know, give, cut yourself some slack. I suppose that's the thing that we've seen people do um, that have actually have probably coping the best through this situation. Definitely engage your support team, you know, both internal, external. Uh, we're part of your support team beyond, um, you know, your internal team. So uh, reckon as a software provider, ourselves as consultants and trainers and educators in the applications. Make sure you're opening communication. Keep communication open with employees. It's stressful time for employees, suppliers, um, customers, and other business owners. 
Look, one thing we do know is that we'll get through this. We just don't know when, but we do know that each day is closer. Um, but I, like most of us, you know, when you're in business, one thing we do like a lot as business owners is certainty and control. And that's probably what we don't have at the moment. We don't have this certainty, uh, but we can bring some control into our day. And part of that is that the thing that we can control is our thinking. I know it's just challenging to sort of even imagine that, but our thinking and attitude and responses to situations is probably about the only thing we can really control. And so how can we take some responsibility, take considered action, just be, by being on this webinar today and watching this, um, you're actually taking considered action to gain more information. It is certainly okay to feel out of control, but not helpless. You know, if you're feeling down and it's getting too much, please reach out to Beyond Blue, uh, Lifeline and others. There's a Head to Health website that the, uh, the government's put together as well, um, which could be a great starting point. Um, look, a bit of the disclaimer. Um, look, this information is general in nature. It's not taxation, HR, investment or financial advice um, specific to your situations. It's based on information available at the time. So the time of the recording and the time you're watching this now. Um, you know, it's actually, um, we are not your accountant or BAS agent in most cases. Um, we're not accountants these days, but we are registered BAS agents. So we need to be to provide this sort of information. So get back in touch with your BAS agent, tax agent, uh, advisor who's qualified to actually help you in detail around this. If you don't have someone in that space, we are here to help. But first of all, I'd recommend definitely getting back in touch with your team that supports you in your business. Let's have a look at the overview of JobKeeper 1.0, um, the original JobKeeper. There was a review that was conducted um, as well, and we'll just touch on the overview of this because a lot of it flows through to the extension. So originally JobKeeper Job was a subsidy, it still is, a subsidy that was introduced by the uh, government to help keep workers connected to their employers during a period when our business or our, our, our economy really has gone into hibernation or actually closes down for up to six months. Now that original six month period finishes on the 27th of September. So it, we, you know, it's been determined that we need more support to continue. Originally it was the qualifying employers would receive $1,500 for each eligible employee. Uh, that rates change, but we still need qualifying employers and eligible employees to be uh, 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 eligible to be um, receive the subsidy. We must pay this amount. It's subject to pay as you go withholding. It can be salary sacrificed or salary packaged um, to, to the employee. And it was for up to 13 fortnights, which finish in a week's time, the 27th of September. A JobKeeper payment was also available to an owner of an entity um, or, or self-employed. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. We had to register and we registered via the business portal using our MyGov ID or, our, or via our tax agents or BAS agents. And that's gonna continue on um, in the JobKeeper extension for those that are new to JobKeeper. The instruments sitting behind all of this, for those that are really interested and want to dig into deep dive into legislation, which I know some of you will, um, there was a coronavirus uh, economic response package that's back in uh, April that was announced and passed legislation. Interestingly, this legislation was what's known as enabling legislation. So it actually is being administered by the ATO. In a lot of cases, the ATO just sort of um, basically uh, runs the uh, legislation or, or actually um, puts into play what governments actually introduce. And so, but in this case, there's been a lot more um, input from the ATO around the rules and guidances as to how JobKeeper is to be administered. There was then a review uh, and then legislation was introduced a few weeks ago and actually passed with a couple of small amendments, the Coronavirus Economic Response Package JobKeeper Payments Amendment Bill 2020. And since then, there's also been some additional guidelines and um, been produced by the uh, tax office as well. So let's have a look at JobKeeper 1.0 um, for the purposes of knowing what's sort of continuing and not continuing here. So an overview, we needed to be an eligible employer and only eligible employees were actually to receive JobKeeper um, subsidy. We'd start on the 30th of March, it ended on the 27th of September, 13 fortnights. We had to have satisfied a reduction in turnover test. This test was just done once. It was either based on our actual turnover comparing year on year, month or quarter, um, or it could be based on projected turnover. So what we forecast basically our decline in turnover to be. We had this initial registration and then there was ongoing monthly reporting to the ATO each month when we were making our, cl our claim for the subsidy for the prior month. We had to continue, we had to make sure we complied with fair work. 
Of course, always. And there were some fair work changes introduced for those employees that were on JobKeeper and employers could actually introduce some enabling instructions to those employees. The payments had to be made to the employees first. We had to satisfy what's known as a wages condition, uh, make the payment to the employees, then the government will reimburse you for the subsidy. We had the ability to bring in eligible business participants, so someone who is not employed in the business but works in the business, it, uh, particularly in the relation to self-employed, you can't employ yourself, uh, but you can qualify as an eligible business participant to receive JobKeeper subsidy. Uh, maybe for trusts and partnerships and, and proprietary limited companies, we could have an additional person who's an eligible business participant, who's actually working in that business, uh, but they're not employed by that business. There was definitely software set up required and uh, there, there'll be more now in JobKeeper 2.1. We had to then go and submit, claim and receive then our JobKeeper subsidy and enter it into our accounting system, obviously, once we received it. What was important is we needed to avoid schemes at all costs. And this is uh, what's known as the integrity measures. And this continues on. There are massive penalties if you try and contrive your business circumstances to receive JobKeeper subsidy. Stay away from that at all costs. The subsidy is just a consequence as to what's happened in your business. It, you don't try and manufacture or construct your business to receive the subsidy. If, if people start talking to you about that, run a mile, um, there's massive penalties um, of, of, uh, that are in place if you do that. So getting up to speed on JobKeeper 1.0, uh, we ran a whole series of webinars. There's been um, two sort of two rounds of those back in April and also in um, July. And there's some references here if you want to deep dive and drill down into uh, and get up to speed on more of JobKeeper um, in detail in JobKeeper 1.0, but also the whole terminology around who qualifies and who didn't. I will touch on this still through this webinar because there's a lot of you on the call that are maybe not in JobKeeper 1 and um, want to get up to speed, obviously, as to quickly as possible as to whether you qualify for JobKeeper 2.1 extension. But we actually, um, well, I will draw your attention to this additional training on JobKeeper payroll items, the usage and setup. There was two YouTube uh, videos here, and, and also um, that one particularly, the first one there. That will show you how to set up all the relevant items for JobKeeper. And now, we'll, in this webinar, we'll show you more details around the actual tiered items that we'll run through in a moment that are relevant to JobKeeper 2.1. The ATO also has a great page actually. Um, it's a timeline of content updates. Um, it shows you what has been added to their website uh, in various months relating to JobKeeper and the day they were added. So this is there's a link down the bottom there. Uh, just by the way too, you don't have to furiously sort of copy down these links or take photos of all of these slides. We'll send them out um, to you. If at the end of the webinar, you just respond to the survey to say you'd like a copy of the slides. Um, and, and also um, that will include all these hyperlinks um, as well. So the new terminology um, that came into play, we probably hadn't heard of any of these words before JobKeeper. We had this JobKeeper subsidy, eligible employers and employees, a JobKeeper fortnight at start and finish. Um, we had a decline in turnover test, a basic test. And, and in JobKeeper 1, we had the, what's known as the alternative test, which we're st still seeing coming through in JobKeeper 2.1 as well. We had this notion of projected and current GST turnover um, in the first JobKeeper. We had eligible business participants. We had this wages condition that we had to satisfy. And we had a claim cycle. Moving through to the extension, JobKeeper 2.1, we had uh, initially 2.0 and now 2.1. We had to retest our turnover uh, based on actual turnover decline. No longer could we use the projected um, method. We had to satisfy or we had to assess an 80 hour test, which we'll talk about in detail in here. And this will determine which tier of payment we received, we will receive in JobKeeper 2.1. There's two tiers now and two different rates. So employer is entitled to JobKeeper when the employer qualifies for the scheme on or before the end of a JobKeeper fortnight and that ATO sort of defined these fortnights. There must have been a payment to the eligible um, employee from the employer, which is the wages condition. Um, and the employer must have notified the ATO of the election to participate in the scheme. So you have to have enrolled. Now, if you're currently enrolled, you don't need to re-enroll. Uh, if you continue on in JobKeeper extension one um, or the second extension even in uh, March or so December next year, January to, to March next year. Uh, if you're currently not enrolled in JobKeeper, you will need to enrol 
Um, and the ATO will be actually putting an enrolment page up on their website um, after the end of this fortnight has finished in the original JobKeeper. So one thing that a lot of people perhaps didn't realise is that there were changes to JobKeeper 1.0. So if you're currently in JobKeeper or been in JobKeeper 1.0, something's changed on the 1st of July. Now it sort of happened in August basically, but what, meant, what it meant was that you could retest your employees at the 1st of July to see if you had any new employees that now qualify for JobKeeper. So for example, if someone arrived after the 1st of March, because the original test date was the 1st of March. And so you might have new employees and you could now claim since the actual um, 3rd of August, which was JobKeeper fortnight 10, um, you could claim JobKeeper for them. You may have had casuals that have uh, ticked over the 12 month um, qualifying period up at between the 1st of March and the 1st of July. So they may now have been eligible. And you also had up until the 31st of August to make any catch up payments to those new employees um, to actually uh, satisfy the JobKeeper wages condition for the fortnight 10 and 11. There was a new form here as well that you, used, you had to nominate, um, give to your employees so they would actually determine their eligibility. Just close that down. Um, so from um, what was announced then is JobKeeper 2.0. Um, and then there was some further announcements around 2.1 once uh, Victoria went into this um, lockdown period. So there was an initial review and this was always going to happen in July. Uh, there was this what's known as a three month review and Treasury undertook this review. And what they discovered is that around 920,000 businesses were take, took up JobKeeper 1.0, which equated to around 40% 40, 40 of all small businesses or all businesses actually in the country. Three and a half million individuals were covered under JobKeeper. Um, it was originally six million that I, you might remember that uh, they thought that would be covered under JobKeeper, but there was an administrative error early on. So it actually scaled back to about three and a half. It covered 30% of the private sector employment. Um, basically $70 billion is being paid out in those first 13 fortnights. Small business or businesses um, recorded a 37% average decline in turnover across all those businesses based on either projected or actuals. So then there was a JobKeeper extension that was recommended and it was recommended that it continues for another six months from the 28th of September 2020 through to the 28th of March 2021. And there was a reduced payment, there was two tiers, so there was uh, two levels and there was sort of two extension periods, one each of three months in length basically. This is estimated to cost another $30 billion, um, which is actually interestingly a 45% reduction over that JobKeeper 1 period. So probably the government's sort of estimating really that about half of businesses will not continue uh, in JobKeeper. So the evolution of JobKeeper uh, that was announced in, in July was that they were extending it and they set down this eligibility criteria to say that originally they said that you had to satisfy a decline in turnover in your business for the June quarter 2020 compared to the June quarter 2019. And you had to satisfy, you know, for most small business, the 30% or more reduction in turnover. They also said that in order to continue receiving JobKeeper under these announcements, you had to also continue to satisfy the decline in turnover test for both the September quarter and then for the December quarter, if you're going to continue to claim JobKeeper from the 4th of January through the 28th of March. However, that all changed when Victoria's um, crisis escalated and the government decided to wind back this criteria quite significantly. So where are we at now? JobKeeper extension 2.1 is coming in on the 28th of September, 2020. Now there's two parts to this. There's extension one and extension two. So in order to qualify for extension one, which is the period covering the 28th of September, 2020, through to the 3rd of January 2021, you must actually satisfy the decline in turnover test on an actual basis. So it needs to be down by the re uh, required percentage or more comparing September quarter turnover this year to September 2019 quarter last year. Interestingly, if you read into the fine print, and this is where it got a bit confusing, is they also said that you'll also need to have satisfied the original decline in turnover test. Now the original decline in turnover test was relating to sort of that six month period up until um, the end of September. 
And I suppose logically, when you see this, you think, well, okay, if I'm qualifying for a reduction in turnover for the September quarter 2020, then I would have already satisfied the decline in turnover test in the original test in JobKeeper 1.0. So it was sort of a funny statement, but so they went on to clarify to say, look, if you're entitled to receive JobKeeper for fortnights before the 28th of September, even if you haven't claimed them, actually, it's just entitled to, um, then you already satisfied the original decline in turnover test. And um, if you're enrolling in JobKeeper the first time from 28th of September 2020, um, if, you act, if you satisfy the actual decline in turnover test, which is September 2020 quarter compared to the prior year's quarter, um, September 2019, then you'll also satisfy the original decline in turnover test. It sounded uh, double speak here, but um, essentially if you have your decline in turnover for the September quarter, then you by definition have already satisfied the original decline in turnover test. For extension two, which starts on the 4th of January, 2021, and runs through the 28th of March, 2021, you also need to have satisfied the original decline in turnover test. Now, this sort of got more interesting when we first read it to say, well, okay, how am I gonna, if I'm only just satisfying the decline in turnover for the December quarter, 2020, for the first time I've had this decline in turnover, then I may not have satisfied my original decline in turnover up to September. However, the government um, announced or the ATO sort of made this modification as well to say, look, the original decline in turnover test, which was meant to finish at the end of September, actually now includes the December 2020 quarter. So essentially what they're saying is if you have a decline in turnover then in the December quarter, then you will, um, subject to all satisfying all the other conditions, you will qualify for extension two, even if you were not eligible for JobKeeper in the original um, decline in turnover test before it was modified to include the December quarter. There's a link there for a bit more information on this. It can sound very confusing uh, and we'll drill in a little bit more around the practical implications of that. So one of the questions we sort of have is, can I be eligible for JobKeeper Extension 2 if I'm not, had not have been eligible for JobKeeper Extension 1? And so the ATO said, yes, you can. You can actually move into Extension 2, so that last three months from the 4th of January. Um, so you can be eligible for JobKeeper Extension 2, even if you're not eligible for JobKeeper Extension 1. So that's the ATO link there. So let's have a look at what's new in JobKeeper 2.1, apart from that original um, decline in turnover test there. So the subsidy has been extended for six months. It starts on the 28th of September, runs through to the 28th of March, 2021, 13 additional fortnights. We've got the two tiers and we'll talk about those dollar values in a moment. Um, you must satisfy an actual decline in turnover test. You can no longer project or sort of estimate almost your, your, that your turnover is going to be reduced. Um, it has to be based on actual turnover. And um, we're awaiting further details on alternative tests. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But the ATO did say that it's gonna be similar to those alternative tests that are available in JobKeeper 1.0. Eligible employees based on those employees at the 1st of March or the 1st of July, that new test date for employees. You must um, continue to comply with fair work changes and there have been some changes um, around annual leave and also reduced hours as well and what directions you can give employees under each of those categories. There's also this new decline in 10% decline in turnover test certificate that fair work is requiring for what's known as legacy employers. So those that don't continue in JobKeeper. So we'll talk about that in detail. There's also a new 80 hour test for employees who worked in February or June, 2020. Um, we'll, we'll go through that in detail. We'll you must continue to comply with the fair work changes. You must pay the employees first to satisfy the wages condition. Business participation entitlements, um, still continue on, they remain in place, but they're also subject to this new 80 hour test only for the month of February, not June. We can't test for that month. Additional software setup will be required. There'll be these new items, tier one and tier two, and we'll look at the details of those. You'll still need to submit, claim, receive your JobKeeper subsidy in the, in the same way that it's happening in JobKeeper 1.0, um, subject to the ATO changing any of that, but there'll be a monthly claim at the end of each, early in the month after the month you're claiming for. Um, and obviously you've got to enrol if it's first time for you. 
We must avoid schemes at all costs. Massive penalties. We've touched on that. Um, keep away from those schemes. So employer uh, qualification criteria as an employer. Really, there's no change from JobKeeper 1.0. You must have been carrying on a business at the 1st of March. So if you started your business after that date, you can't just suddenly get into JobKeeper. It's, it's, not, it's a no-go. Um, you must have had an ABN by the 12th of March and also have lodged a tax return or a BAS up, up to that date. So if you registered in January, for example, of your business and haven't lodged, didn't lodge your BAS until April, um, you're not in. Um, you will not qualify. So uh, you could also be a not-for-profit. You must satisfy a decline in turnover, and now it's quarterly, year on year. For small, most small businesses, it's 30% fall in turnover if your aggregate business turnover is under a billion dollars, and for charities, a 15% fall in um, donations and gifts from charities. It does exclude banks, government agencies, uh, schools, public and private universities, local councils. Uh, any business with a provisional or appointed liquidator is not eligible. And also childcare providers were excluded from the scheme since the 20th of July. So let's have a look at a summary here. This is quite a, um, it's a, it's a link on the ATO website. It's sort of an infographic that talks about what we've really been talking about for the last 10 minutes. Um, the legislation has been passed. You will now have these two tier rates. So for eligible employees, and they talk about 20 hours a week on, or more a week on average here. It's actually been changed to 80 hours over a four week period um, in either March or, or the pay period ending before March or July, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, also eligible business participants will continue, and you've got these two rates. So if you worked under the um, under 80 hours in that um, reference period, which we'll talk about shortly, your rate that you'll actually receive from the ATO for JobKeeper subsidy will be $750 a fortnight for each eligible employee up until the 3rd of January. Uh, if they worked over those 80 hours, then it'll be $1,200 per fortnight. They were basically trying to sort of uh, make a split or, or a, um, a distinction between casuals perhaps and part-time employees working low hours before JobKeeper started and before coronavirus hit um, so that the rate has been sort of adjusted on the back of the basis of that hours worked. Extension two is going to further reduce tier, two, tier one rate drops down to $1,000 per fortnight and tier two rate goes on to be $650 per fortnight after the 4th of January through to the 28th of March if you qualify for that further extension. So let's have a look at that. For JobKeeper 2.1, um, for the first extension, 28th of September to the 3rd of January, got to satisfy the wages condition, must still pay a minimum amount to the employer per fortnight based on their tier classification. So from the 28th of September, the payments are $1,200 for, per fortnight for all eligible employees who in the four weeks of pay periods, so these are pay periods that end before the 1st of March or the 1st of July, and we're working in the business for 80 hours or more, you will qualify for the $1,200 per fortnight. If you're an eligible business participant and you're actively engaged in the business um, for 80 hours or more in the month of February, you and it's only the month of February that you need to test on, you can't test in July, then you will qualify for the $1,200. Anyone else, um, i.e. worked less than those hours in the, in the reference or the test period, it will be $750 per fortnight. And there's a few links there today, more details around that. Moving through to the 4th of January to the 28th of March, again, you've got to make sure you've paid the payment to the employee before you claim the um, subsidy and it's got to be paid within the JobKeeper fortnight. So from the 4th of January, uh, the tier one rate will scale down to $1,000 per fortnight and tier two, $650 per fortnight. So can I, uh, a question we have had from people over the last six months, can I voluntarily stop claiming the JobKeeper subsidy? Look, the short answer is yes. Probably the we'd question, well, why? Um, but some employers have done this. Um, the JobKeeper is essentially employer subsidy. You've obviously still got to satisfy um, that you, you know, you can't then, you still got to pay employees for what work they do and you don't get that confused with the subsidy. Um, that, so the JobKeeper is an employer subsidy, which you claim, not an employee entitlement. However, you may now that there's an extension be eligible up to the 28th of March depending on some changing circumstances and whether you qualify with decline in turnover. So I'd probably be cautious about actually opting out um, and not continuing or notifying that you're not continuing. Um, otherwise you still are in the system. What if I don't have any employees? Can my business still qualify for the JobKeeper subsidy? Uh, yes, 
You know, if, if, if you're otherwise eligible, so you've got the decline in turnover, then your business may still be eligible for JobKeeper by nominating an eligible business participant, even though you don't have um, any employees as such. Is the cash flow boost also being extended? No. The final instalment, and for those of you that are uh, group employers or employers um, that have been receiving the cash flow boost, this final instalment will be paid to you after you lodge your September 2020 BAS. So that is not being extended. If you're currently in JobKeeper 1.0, you're still in at least until the 27th of September. That's when it finishes, JobKeeper 1.0. So, um, you know, that's going to finish up shortly. And technically, it's not too late to check your eligibility for JobKeeper 1.0. Um, because that was based on sort of comparing periods up until September or, or months or projected even um, turnover figures. So you may be eligible to enrol now and receive um, the last fortnight's um, subsidy. Let's have a look at eligible employees and what has changed here, if anything. So the, the employee must have been employed at the 1st of July. Uh, that was the 1st of March. The 1st of March date has still been preserved. Um, but if you've got new employees, um, then you can add them to and they'll be included in the JobKeeper extension. Uh, must have been 16 years or older at the 1st of July, but they couldn't have been a financially dependent student under the age of 18. They must be full-time or part-time employees um, um, or long-term casuals. So long-term casuals must have been with employer for 12 months or more. Now that new date is the 1st of July, so you can test that as at the 1st of July. Um, and they cannot have been permanently employed with another employer. So they can't be a casual or full-timer anywhere else um, to claim that casual status with you. You must have been an Australian resident under the Social Securities Act. Um, and that would be the case if you're an Australian citizen, the whole holder of a permanent visa or a protected special category visa, or um, a, a tax resident with a special category um, subclass 444 visa. If you're already in JobKeeper, there's no need to retest or re-enroll eligible employees. Eligible business participants. So a, one individual per entity. So if this is new to you um, and you qualify for the extension um, of JobKeeper, you may be able to nominate um, one individual per entity uh, that is not an employee and the business actually decides who they nominate. Um, only one job keeper payment will be allowed for that individual, so you can't double dip as an employee somewhere else. You must be actively engaged in the business. Um, the tier amounts will now be subject to this new 80 hour test, which we'll look at in detail here, or an alternative test around that 80 hour test. Uh, you can't be a not for profit um, to nominate an eligible business participant. The business must qualify for JobKeeper on or before the end of the JobKeeper fortnight, in which you're actually making that claim or registering. The entity must have had an ABN at the 12th of March, uh, although you, you don't need to be GST registered. You may just have had an ABN. JobKeeper payment is paid to the entity, except in the case of a sole trader who's paid through to obviously the individual. Um, so it's paid to the entity. It's actually income to the entity, uh, not the individual. Whereas, um, you know, and then you've got to decide, well, okay, then how do we pay that out of the business to the individual, which you may or may not. Um, but that's a question for your tax advisor more than likely. Are sole traders subject to the 80 hours worked in February 2020? Um, yes, so a sole trader, in order to continue to be eligible, um, you know, you must have been actively engaged in the business, which was the original sort of um, definition, um, for 80 hours or more in February to claim the tier one rate. So that's the higher rate of $1,200 for the first JobKeeper extension or $1,000 for the second JobKeeper extension. Otherwise, the reduced rate, the tier two rate um, will apply. So let's have a look at this 80 hour test. What actually is it? So JobKeeper 2.1, this is a new new concept of this 80 hour test. So, and the, and the test is being done in order for the government to determine which rate, which payment rate, the higher rate, the tier one rate, or the lower rate, the tier two rate is to be paid to you as a subsidy for, for eligible employees. And so eligible employees who in what's known as the reference period, and just think of the reference period as being actually the four weeks of pay periods that ended before the 1st of March or the 1st of July. So if you had a pay, a pay period, let's say a fortnight finishing on the 20th of um, February, and then the next fortnights 
is, you know, obviously in, in early March, you would start with the 20th of February and move back four weeks. The same, you could, and you could also do it for July. So you can choose which month you actually run this test for and whichever gives you the higher hours is what you can run with. Um, and for eligible business participants um, who are actively engaged in the business for 20 hours or more per week or 80 hours, sorry, over that four week period, um, in the so 80 hours for the month of February. And that's obviously this year was a leap year. So what, the 1st to the 29th of February, um, you had to sort of demonstrate that um, you'd work 80 hours or more in that month, then you would receive the tier one rate, um, less than 80 hours actively engaged, that'd be the lower rate. Look, the ATO is providing some guidance where employees were paid in non-weekly or non-fortnightly pay periods, for example, um, monthly, and you think of a month covering, let's say 31 days, um, then it could be 28 divided by 31 to work out the hours, you know, that are, that are prorated for that 28 day period being four weeks. So the commissioner does have discretion to set out alternative tests where an employee or business participant hours were not usual. So there may have been a case where they were on leave, although if it was paid leave, um, leave hours are counted as hours worked, even though they weren't there working them. And also um, any public holidays as well that they're paid for would be included in hours worked. Volunteering during the bushfires or um, not employed for part of February, um, there are some um, ex discretionary um, alternative tests around that that the ATO has actually set out and there's a link through to them there at the bottom. What if I pay my employees amounts not related to an hourly rate? For example, commissions. It's, uh, so there is no hours, you know, that people are trying to, or, or it might be piece rate sort of payments. So if you've paid your employees, uh, what they're saying is if you've paid your employees $1,500 or more, excluding any JobKeeper top up, during the 28 day reference period, so, um, you know, think, then you can claim the tier one rate. So it's just this flat test of if you paid them $1,500 in that four week reference period, then you could claim the higher tier one rate. And there's a reference to that page there. Or if you've got insufficient records, you know, you don't have hours work, hours worked, you don't retain that information or you've or the or the um, information has been lost or destroyed. So you or, or don't have it, um, then you may be able to qualify under that rate there. So let's have a look at how do we display hours worked in February or June in that reference period. And what we'll do is we'll go into Reckon Accounts here and we'll modify the payroll summary report. So we'll look at Reckon Accounts, whether you're using Reckon Accounts or Hosted or um, some other application, the, the, the notion is going to be the same here. What we're trying to work out is how many hours have been recorded as worked on pays for periods that have ended up until the end of um, the last pay period before the end of um, February and before the 1st of July. So I'll come back to this screen. Um, just I just have brought this screen up as a snapshot as to what we're gonna show you in the software in a moment, um, just because you'll have this in the slides, obviously. Um, you know, Critical that you remember, this is based on four weeks from the date of the last pay period ended. So not the date that you're paying the employees. So if, um, if you are paying someone in March for hours worked in February, so if your pay period end date finishes at the end of Feb, then you need to actually obviously modify these dates that you're looking at this range for based on covering the period that the pay period relates to, not actually, um, you know, even though the payment date might have been in March. So you may need to run this report into, into March or into July. So if I'll head on over to actually the software itself. So what I want to do here is I just want to run, I'll close down a couple of reports here. I'm just going to run a report and it's going to be my payroll summary report. And I'll jump into the payroll summary. I want to run this um, for a specific period. So I want to look back in um, February. And what I've worked out in this file is that um, they, the last pay period ran up to the 28th or the date they were paid, sorry, the pay period is the four weeks ending the 28th of February. Um, so you've got to look, and they were paid in February, um, but obviously if they were paid in March, you've got to choose a March date and move back that period. So if I looked at, let's say from the 1st of uh, February through to the um, 28th of Feb, and I want to show um, the hours on this report, we can see a whole uh, list column of hours here. And you're looking for those that have got greater than, um, the 80 hours, basically. 
The other thing that you could do, if you want to drill into this a little bit further, we could then go and actually modify a report. And if I looked at uh, drill into, and I'll, I'll go into the payroll summary here, I've just drilled into the total gross pay here that makes up all the individual gross pay items. And I actually modified this report to include some columns. If I went to modify a report, I turned on a series of columns and the columns were, show me hours worked, um, show me from what dates to and from, and show me the payment date. So that might be quite useful to work out, oh, okay, yeah, I paid them even in the next period um, or for a period earlier or later. So that you've got the right payment date from and to, that's what's critical. It needs to be that four week period. If I jump back um, out of there, um, that's just a snapshot of that screen as well. Let's go into Reckon 1. For those of you using Reckon 1, we'll do a similar sort of thing. I'm going to run a report and all I've done here is I've just gone onto my uh, reports area and I've gone to the report center. And from there, I actually have ran um, a payroll report. So I go back to there. It's a payroll report and I'm looking at the um, payroll detail report here. And I'm modifying again, I'm checking very carefully, well, what dates am I looking at here? The, I've got the first to the 28th. I, I, this file, the business has um, paid, finished their last pay in February and it actually got paid on the 28th. In, and, the, and the date that it's finished is, is the same day. It may not be the case for you though, you've got to critically look at those dates and the payment dates. So we've got now quantity, the quantity column. So I just turned on, I went to um, the options here and make sure that we've got the quantity tick box ticked for our columns. And you can see the total quantity being the hours worked or hours entered um, for those pays. So let's have a look at the JobKeeper turnover test in a little more detail here. So the original decline in turnover test, um, you must have satisfied this before the fortnight in which you're going to start claiming JobKeeper. Um, there are some concessions around that. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, we must now compare, um, or in the past, sorry, we could compare our projected GST turnover. That, that you cannot do anymore. Um, what happens is we, own, and this is JobKeeper 1.0, we could have done it by monthly or quarter, right up until the end of September or projected or actual. So we had all these different choices and options under our JobKeeper 1.0, which is where you, most of you would have already um, addressed that by now being in JobKeeper 1.0. So you could still, as I said earlier, you could still technically enter JobKeeper 1.0. You've got a few days left, um, and but you can't backdate. So if you start to, if you register now, enroll now, you can't go back and claim, even though you may well have been eligible for earlier fortnights. This, uh, this test only needed to be satisfied once and it was not retested under the JobKeeper 1.0 program. However, so you do not though automatically qualify for JobKeeper extension if you're currently receiving the JobKeeper subsidy. As I said earlier, we need to satisfy these new um, turnover tests. Now, just for those of you, um, I'm just touching on here, the alternative turnover tests. These were the tests that were in place and there's a link there where businesses um, didn't perhaps have a comparative period, or if they were comparing to a prior period in the prior year, then it may have unfairly disadvantaged the business. Um, instances where the new business commenced after the relevant comparison period. So you may have started the business in you know, September or October last year, so you don't really have a comparison um, period to compare to. What if you made a major business acquisition that really just pumped up the sales in this and, and overstated or made these current period sales um, look awfully, obviously a lot higher than a, a period in the past. It's not comparing like for like. You had adverse conditions. Maybe there was drought during that comparison period which understated your income on a regular, on a normal basis. You had a substantial increase in turnover. Turnover, you might have been a startup. You had seasonal factors. Um, you could have been a sole trader impacted by illness. So the ATO had all these alternative tests. You weren't just knocked out straight away if you didn't satisfy that um, decline in turnover basic test. But if you do satisfy the basic test where you know that your turnover you know, went down from one quarter to the next year on year, then there was no need to apply the alternative test. And there was all these guidelines around that. What we're waiting on just right at the moment is the specific alternative test relating to JobKeeper 2.1 extension. But the ATO has said that they're going to be very similar. So what that really means, um, we, well, I won't say the word assume, um, we, we would expect them to be in line with these with some modifications to take into account different dates. 
Actual GST turnover, um, in the original instance, um, was GST turnover. There was a whole definition as to what GST turnover is. Um, it included all taxable supplies and GST free supplies. However, it excludes input tax supplies, things like interest, residential rent, um, dividends, and also um, it would include export sales, but those that are not connected with Australia. So sales or services made through a business you carry on outside of the country, um, sales of goods are that are purchased and sold at, um, outside of Australia, or sale of real property situated outside of Australia were excluded. Um, a decline in overseas operations will not be counted in your turnover test. Um, and obviously now we, it's important to remember that turnover does not include your JobKeeper subsidy that you receive or the business cash flow boost money that you receive. So it's important to get those numbers out of the equation and we'll look at that in a moment. So, but JobKeeper 2.1, the extension, uh, the turnover dish definition does now include proceeds on sale of assets. That was, that was excluded in the original JobKeeper turnover actual comparison. So that could impact people significantly. Some people may be, have been needed to sell assets to just fund their business. And that's now going to be counted as a as turnover for the purposes of your current period um, actuals. JobKeeper 2.1, um, we've done, said it probably three or four times, but it's no, we're no, now no longer allowed to project a turnover reduction. It has to be based on actual figures. Uh, one question that comes up is, what if I lodge my BAS monthly? Can I compare a single month in the quarter to determine my eligibility for the JobKeeper extension? And the answer is no, it needs to be a quarter comparison. So you've got to compare your actual GST turnover with uh, the quarter, so September quarter, um, to be eligible for extension one, to the same quarter in the prior year. Um, but there are alternative tests being put forward by the ATO um, or for those that lodge a BAS annually as well. So these details um, are, are to be released by the tax office. If my business turnover drops below 75,000, excluding GST, am I still eligible for JobKeeper? A lot of people got confused about this value or vo volume of turnover. You are, um, but if it's, so it's not based on any particular turnover number. I mean, you could have uh, no income. That's still counted as turnover. So the amount of your actual business turnover has no bearing on the eligibility. Um, it's the decline, it's the rate of decline. Uh, does it satisfy that 30% or more for small to medium sized businesses? Um, cash or accruals, this has come up a lot. There's been a lot of discussion and um, confusion around this. In JobKeeper 1.0, the ATO sort of had three different views on whether you could use cash or accruals um, in, in a week, basically. And they sort of ended up settling on this. Well, we would expect that you will use the GST accounting method that you normally use. So they sort of were trying to move you to that direction in JobKeeper 1.0. However, that technically there was nothing really stopping you from using cash or accruals um, as, as a comparison pe period, um, so long as you're consistent for the comparison period. They're sort of, they then settled on saying, if you normally account for GST on an accruals basis, but seek to calculate on a cash basis or vice versa, we may seek to understand your circumstances to ensure that the calculation achieves an appropriate reflection of your turnover. There was all these other pieces of definitions around turnover too, um, which, which I won't go into here, but in, generally speaking, um, they wanted to, you to actually do it on the same basis that you're actually accounting for your GST, but you didn't have to. Um, if you aren't registered for GST, the ATO um, expected in the first version that you'd be use the same accounting method that you use for income tax purposes, cash or accruals. And if you're not sure about that, talk to your accountant. JobKeeper 2.1, um, if you're not registered for GST, now they're stating that you can use cash or accruals. So you've got that choice. However, if you are GST registered, then unlike the original decline in turnover test back in JobKeeper 1.0, there is now only one method you can use to determine when you make your supply when it comes to cash or accruals. Supplies must be allocated to a period on a GST reporting basis. Um, so you allocate your supplies in the same way as taxable supplies are allocated for GST and, and you know, plausibly rep recorded on the BAS. So they've sort of locked that down, particularly in JobKeeper 2.1 to take away any ambiguity there. So then what is GST turnover? I know we've touched on it there earlier, but the ATO is now looking to adopt a direct comparison of your data, really trying to compare BASs. So 
you know, they've already got the September 2019 BAS, although they, and, or they, if they haven't, you have to get it to them before you're eligible for this extension. Um, and so you'll have your, then they'll have your September BAS. So they'll be able to run sort of some diagnostics across that that notionally sort of show that decline in turnover. The challenge with doing this is it's a bit more detailed and complicated than that, than just looking at your BAS, but essentially they're moving you in that direction. Um, there's details around that. Um, they're, they're sort of providing more details around that calculation, but for many businesses, but they've stated that if you register for GST, this calculation will match the total sales reported at G1 on your BAS minus any GST payable, which is 1A, if G1 includes GST. It's, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not a fan of that statement because there's actually a lot more to it than that. Um, and plausibly, who's to say your BAS is actually right? Um, you've got to go back to first principles as to what is your turnover, what's the definition of turnover, what's included, not included. And then, yeah, hopefully your BAS has been configured correctly and, and that shows it. Um, but I wouldn't just be relying on the BAS. If you're not registered for GST, then you can use cash or accruals. Um, what if I calculated my turnover on a cash basis to qualify for JobKeeper 1.0? but my BAS is actually prepared on an accruals basis. Do I have to use the same basis for JobKeeper 2.1? So no, as I said there, you must use the same basis as, it, as your GST reporting basis. Um, so if you're on accruals, then now under extension, the JobKeeper extension, you must uh, look at your turnover on an accruals basis, obviously excluding GST. Um, so there'll be, no, however, there'll be no, there's no retest of the JobKeeper 1.0 basis. That's locked in stone. You've done that test on the basis of the information available that was that was available to you at that time, and you're eligible to go on either basis there, subject to being um, contriving to actually get the um, get the subsidy when you may not have otherwise always been eligible. But there's no retest of that. But you must now do it on the same reporting basis as your BAS when you're looking at these numbers. So let's have a look at that turnover comparison. We'll dive into Reckon Accounts and also, um, which you know, or Reckon Hosted uh, for anyone using that. Just before we do, without me running the BAS live in, during the webinar, I've done some screenshots here. So basically, um, at a very basic rudimentary level, um, you're sort of taking the G1 figure. Um, now in this case, if you've prepared your BAS saying that's including GST, then you have to remove then whatever's showing at 1A. So those two numbers, the 245 minus the 22, uh, will, will come down, down to sort of 223,000 for this business. Um, but again, remember, this is not definitive evidence for decline in turnover. This is just your, how you, this is just the numbers on your BAS. Um, so I would um, caution that. So when we're looking at the profit and loss, um, and we can see that we've got that 223,000 there, I'm going to jump over actually into um, the file here. I'm going to look at um, last or oh, this financial quarter, because we're still in September quarter at the moment. I'm going to modify this report to show the previous year, and I'm going to look at dollar change and percentage change. Um, I want to collapse that down just to make it a little easier to read. And I also um, want to modify this report, and let's show our negative figures in parentheses um, in bright red. So it's a little easier to read. So we can see here, it's July to September, and obviously you've got to make sure that your income is all um, included in income. It may be scattered throughout your profit and loss. You might have it down in other income as well. So you've got to take care of that to make sure you're looking at the right numbers. Uh, we're comparing one year to the other. We're on a cruel basis here. If you needed to modify that, you could change it to cash. And we can see that we've got a 42.6% uh, reduction in turnover. So let's have a look at Reckon 1 to see how we can actually um, get those same reports to see if we actually qualify for that reduction in turnover test for that period. So I'm going to run my go to my reports again. I'm going to open that up in a new tab. And I'm going to look at my financial reports and the profit and loss. So what I want to do is run it for this quarter and I want to compare it to this quarter last year. And I want to show my variance percentage. You can show the dollar value if you want to. Um, but I'll just show it as a this percentage. And so when I scroll down here, you can see that this business on a cash is on a cash basis. Um, and you check that that matches your BAS. And so we can see that we've got a 70% reduction um, in turnover or sales during that period. So that's all the income that we had. 
um, it's the only category we're using, the sales category. So notionally, that, that business would actually qualify um, for the reduction in turnover. And I've just done a screenshot there for you, which might be useful um, to actually refer to when you get the slides. So what if I have a decline in turnover greater than 30% for the first time in the December quarter? Am I still eligible for JobKeeper? So if your business satisfied the JobKeeper decline in turnover test for the December quarter, and you hadn't previously, then you will or may still be eligible for extension two, um, subject to satisfying all the other criteria um, around being an eligible employer. So the short answer is yes. Um, you don't have to have been in JobKeeper 1.0 or even extension one to qualify for extension two, which is based on a December quarter um, comparison period. The other question is, can I re-enter JobKeeper if previously claiming the subsidy? For example, you operate a small business and have been ineligible, have been eligible, sorry, for JobKeeper 1.0 through to the 27th of September. And then, then your turnover in the September quarter had increased. It wasn't down 30% compared to the September quarter last year. And you don't actually qualify for the, any, the alternative test rules. So you don't qualify for JobKeeper Extension 1. However, in early January 2021, um, you do determine that turnover for the December quarter is down compared to the prior year for December quarter by more than 30%. Does your business requalify for JobKeeper Extension 2? Well, the ATO says you can be eligible for JobKeeper Extension 2, even if you were not eligible for JobKeeper Extension 1. So you can, it looks like you can go out and come back in. Um, do we need to re-enroll? Well, they're saying if you've already been in JobKeeper, then there's no re-enrolment. So we're looking for a little bit more confirmation around this. It's probably not gonna be that relevant until obviously um, early January, um, but it sounds as though you would not need to re-enroll. You would just then make a claim for January in early February. Do I need to let the ATO know that I'm continuing on in JobKeeper Extension 1 uh, when my business is already receiving JobKeeper, uh, JobKeeper subsidy under the original JobKeeper? Um, as I mentioned, you don't need to re-enroll um, if you're already enrolled and you don't need to reassess employees eligibility or ask employees to agree to, um, to be nominated by you. You don't need those new, um, any of those forms to be really filled out for employees if you're already claiming them in the original JobKeeper. Um, and you don't need to meet any further requirements if you're claiming for an eligible business participant either. It's just that 80 hour test is gonna determine at what rate um, the, the continuing employees and eligible business participant will be paid or re you'll be reimbursed at. Uh, do I need to let the ATO know that I'm no longer claiming JobKeeper for my employees at the end of JobKeeper 1 or at the end of Extension 1 period? No, the, the, there's no sort of um, notification that I'm finishing as an as a employer. Um, you only uh, let the ATO know for individual employees that are no longer eligible during the JobKeeper program. So for example, they've resigned, terminated or, com or commenced receiving paid parental leave subsidy or commence workers comp um, fully incapacitated or become bankrupt. So the, um, you know, in, in the case of um, anyone who's, uh, you know, you would, in that case, you would include the JobKeeper finish um, fortnight number that you're finishing. If, you're, if they're finishing up in a period that you are currently eligible and claiming for JobKeeper. So let's have a look at the summary of the next steps just to sort of round out here. Commencing and claiming JobKeeper Extension 1 for, that starts on the 28th of September through to 3rd of January. You must first of all satisfy the decline in turnover test for the September quarter. You've got to register for the subsidy if this is your first time claiming and you do that through the business portal um, after, and the ATO hasn't got that up and running just yet for the extension but uh, that can't be far away. You'd nominate your employees, you'd have to um, get them to fill out the relevant em employee nomination form, eligibility form. You would uh, split them between tier one and tier two, and we'll do that through our payroll items, and I'll show you that in a moment, and we'll submit through, through single touch payroll, or if you're not in single touch payroll, you'd have to actually do it through the business portal or through your agents. We need to notify the employees of the rate. So now that there's a differing rates, so there'll be tier one and tier two rates, we actually have an obligation to notify employees within seven days of notifying the ATO of the employee's tier. Um, if applicable, um, nominate an eligible business participant. Um, if you're new to a JobKeeper, you may be eligible and they'll be a tier one or tier two. That'll be part of the registration process. Um, 
And for self-employed people, th that notification is, is actually part of the monthly declaration at the end of each month when you're making the claim. Need to pay the employees, um, need to make that minimum payment to employees. Interestingly, this, the first fortnight in uh, the October um, month, so that's, that starts on the 28th of September, so that's the um, 14th fortnight of JobKeeper, and the 15th fortnight, which is the 12th of October, you actually have until the 31st of October to pay the top up, if any is required. So you'd imagine a lot of people, you know, you, you won't know your decline in turnover amounts until the September quarter's finished and you've got your book work done. One tip I would have is please stay up to date with your book work. You know, if you're not current right now, get current. So you know where your turnover's up to very, very early um, in October. And then you can see that you've satisfied or not satisfied for the continuing JobKeeper extension. Um, but you will have up until the 31st of October to top up those payments to get to the minimum payment amount of $1,200 or $750, depending on which tier the employee belongs to. Um, obviously, you've still got to pay them for the wages that they work. Um, but if there's a top up required, you do have through till the 31st of October to make that payment. That's a, that's a one-off concession there. We've got to continue to comply with fair work flexible conditions. So if we have got um, enabling some directions to employees based on fair work changes for those that are um, under JobKeeper, then we need to actually comply with all the fair work rules around that. We would then make a claim for the subsidy in the following month. So the October claim uh, would be made available to make that claim in early November through the business portal or through your BAS or tax agent. Um, likewise, the next period extension two, um, very, very similar. The only thing I sort of want to point out here, I suppose, is that um, will there be some top up extensions, um, whoop, if I go back, for January? So will we have some more time in January to, um, because we may not know the start of January, when what our turnover reduction is, because, oh my good goodness at me, I mean, it's a, I think most people are trying to enjoy a few days off at Christmas this year um, of all years. So will there be an extension for making those top up payments in January? Highly likely, but we haven't seen anything um, in concrete in the ATO on that. So what if I have to pay my employees on the 28th of September? So that's the, I, I've got a pay that's due then, um, but I don't know if I've qualified for JobKeeper 2.1 yet. What top up should I pay if I have to pay a top up? Look, a lot of the advice coming out is a lot, so a lot of um, uh, you know, advisors are sort of saying, um, consider communicating with your employees that no top up will, will be paid. It'll, it'll be on hold at the moment while you're determining the decline in turnover and eligibility. So as an employer, you do have until the 31st of October to actually pay any top up retrospectively for those first two fortnights. So, um, you know, once you notify the ATO of eligible employees tier levels, then you must also notify the employees with seven days. So this sort of all assists with the transparency and integrity. So that, that's a delicate one, um, but the reality is if you don't qualify for JobKeeper extension one and you're paying a top up in those first couple of fortnights, then that's it, you've paid it. Um, you've overpaid your employees effectively because you're not gonna get that JobKeeper subsidy um, paid to you. So Fair Work and JobKeeper 2.1, there's been a few changes here as well. So all JobKeeper eligible employees um, are going to be subject to this. So there's this new notion of legacy employers, and I've probably got another sort of 10 minutes to go on this webinar, so bear with us, there's still a bit to get through. All legacy employers, so who's a legacy employer? So a legacy employer is someone who was in JobKeeper and now is no longer in JobKeeper but you still have the ability to apply some of the fair work changes and, and sort of have those concessions available to you for a period of time. Um, it's just so that we're not going sort of cold turkey. You finish JobKeeper, you've got to wind back all the um, concessions that fair work gave you um, in employment conditions. But in order to, sat to, to continue um, utilising some of those um, concessional directives, you must have a 10% decline in turnover certificate in place. So we'll talk about what that is in a moment. Um, the other thing to consider is as of the 28th of September, annual leave, enabling directions around annual leave, where you could, in, you could force employees to take their annual leave down to a minimum of two weeks, that ceases. You don't have that option available whether you're in JobKeeper or not anymore after the 28th of September. Um, 
and you also, an enabling direction must now, not after the 28th of September, must not result in employees working less than two hours on a work day or reduce full-time or part-time employees' work hours of work to less than 60% of their ordinary hours as of the 1st of March, so pre-COVID. And also any agreements to take annual leave revert back to the usual rules for all employers, all employers on the 28th of September. So this 10% decline in turnover certificate, this is something required by fair work, not the ATO, um, it's all about fair work. So this, they require all legacy employers, if they want to continue to apply JobKeeper fair work changes, and so if you're previously in JobKeeper 1.0, um, it's used to actually signify that you still satisfy um, a decline in turnover of 10% or more. Um, it can, this, this, this certificate can be issued or completed by a registered tax agent or BAS agent or a qualified accountant defined under the corporation's law. Small employers, um, you may not need to use those um, uh, other parties. You can, if you've got under 15 employees, complete a stat deck yourself. Um, now, when does it have to be completed by? We'll look at that in a moment. The stat decks themselves, um, there's a link here to the Attorney General's Department of what a stat deck looks like. Um, and the employer must be authorised, or the person who's actually signing this must be authorised by the employer and have knowledge of the employer's financial matters if you're going to go it alone and do it without the assistance of your advisors. So the 10% decline in turnover certificate must be um, issued for each quarter. So legacy employers will need to satisfy the turnover test and have a certificate or stat deck for each relevant quarter. It's not just you get one and then you run all the way through to the 28th of um, March next year. They have to be sort of done on a quarter by quarter basis. If you don't have it in place, then all of the JobKeeper enabling directions and agreements will automatically end. And if they end and you're still doing it, you are up for some serious, serious penalties. So please make sure that you get this in place. So if you don't have it in place, by the 28th of October, if, these ten, if this condition isn't met, then for the September quarter 2020, you've got to finish up by the 28th of October having that in place. Um, those concessions can't be used after the 28th of October. And if these conditions aren't met for the December 2020 quarter, you've got through to the 28th of February and that's it. So therefore, a legacy employer will need a certificate for the June quarter, and this is where June gets introduced, for the June quarter you need to show that you've got a 10% decline in turnover if you want to use the Fair Work JobKeeper provisions between the 28th of September and the 27th of October inclusive. For the September quarter, if you want to use these provisions between the 28th of October and the 27th of February, you need to have in place that September quarter 10% decline in turnover certificate. And for the December 2020 quarter, um, you need to have that in place if you're going to continue to use those concessions from the 28th of February to the, through to the end of JobKeeper extensions, which is the 28th of March. There is a certificate here for those um, advisors on the call here today, uh, registered tax agents, BAS agents. Um, there is a template that's been created at Fair Work that you can download. There's a Word doc version there or the PDF version. So let's have a look at our reporting for JobKeeper 2.1. We had this notion of JobKeeper fortnights and they started off on the 31st, 30th of March and run through the 27th of September. That's for the current JobKeeper. Now that's going to continue. We're gonna run through from fortnights 14 to 26, so another 13 fortnights. And so, and you'll be claiming sort of on a bulk block month basis. Um, and these are the dates of the fortnights in which the eligible employees must be paid those minimum amounts, those tier one or tier two amounts, depending on their qualifying criteria. Um, one thing that's been a little confusing is December. Um, December actually finishes on the 3rd of January. Uh, there's three fortnights then in December. So then JobKeeper extension two starts in on the 4th of January. So otherwise you'd sort of be making this claim for one fortnight um, in December, so in January, sorry. So three, three fortnights in December, um, and then it runs out through then till the 28th of March. So what's changing in our software? Well, there is some changes. We didn't think there were any for, for a while there, um, but just recently there's been some announced changes. And obviously uh, your software providers reckon will produce more information around this. Um, so it'll be subject to sort of the finalization criteria from the FEM and the ATO. But as it stands right now, this is what we need to do. There'll be a new JobKeeper payroll items required. And we'll look at um, in, in Reckon Accounts and Reckon One here. Um, it'll be an addition item very similar to the setup of those initial items, JobKeeper start and finish and top up. Um, 
it will be uh, an allowance dash other type. And so therefore we need to add these um, new items, JK dash tier one and JK dash tier two for nil amounts to all eligible employees um, who we're actually making claims for in JobKeeper extension 2.14. And so we'll need to um, obviously, first of all, determine which rate belongs to which employee. So that's just based on those that 80 hour test. Um, if you're starting JobKeeper, you'll also obviously need JobKeeper dash start dash FN XX. So this might be Fortnite um, 14 um, if you're starting off in JobKeeper extension one. Um, JobKeeper finish dash Fortnite XX will still be used for those where um, someone's resigning or terminated or, or paid parental leave, for example. Um, you use these items uh, once. There's no need to add it to the permanent record in the master file in your software. Um, they're, they're simply a flag that is submitted to the ATO via single touch payroll, but they need to be in there be, for at least once because that way the ATO knows that you're claiming um, tier one or tier two for that individual employee. JobKeeper top-ups is still used. Um, and so that's used to top up the employee's um, pay in that fortnight to up to the minimum of either um, 1200 or 750 for that first JobKeeper extension fortnight. Uh, still not subject to, um, sorry, it is subject to pay as you go withholding, but superannuation SGC super is optional and it can be salary sacrificed. Um, what I would also suggest is to review your software to see if an amount is already in the employment information screen. For those employees that are stood down, for example, you may have 1500 sitting in there um, as, as part of a standard pay. So you'll need to change that um, accordingly to the new rates that are relevant for the extension. So let's drill into those and have a look. So I'm just gonna go into our payroll item list. I'll go into Reckon Accounts first um, and we'll have a look at those JobKeeper um, payroll items. So if I jump into lists, um, payroll item list, and you can see here, I've all already set them up actually to save a little bit of time, but if I double click on there, it's actually an addition type. So if I right mouse click and set new, you're choosing addition as the type. Um, and if I move through, I've got JobKeeper dash tier dash two, it needs to be that exact wording, um, no lowercase, it needs to be uppercase exactly as it is there. You can, it, it's a nil amount, so you can send it to whatever uh, profit and loss account you like. I'm just sending it to the, a, a JobKeeper top up um, account. It go, could, could go straight to salaries and wages or an allowance in your PL. Um, it's allowances dash other, tax tracking type, no pay as you go. Um, and it's just, it can be a nil amount. Um, you can type that in there or not. Um, you can type that um, at the time of entering the transaction or just leave it blank. Um, no super as well. So those items need to be created and then added to the first eligible uh, first fortnight that the employee is eligible in JobKeeper extension, uh, which is probably this fortnight beginning the 28th of um, September, um, the, the pay that's in that actual fortnight. But you've got to know that you qualify first, of course. Um, I will jump then over to uh, Reckon Accounts, uh, sorry, Reckon One. If we look in the actual pay items setup, um, you can see there that we've got this allowance called JobKeeper um, tier. And I've just set that up with JobKeeper um, tier dash one or tier one. Uh, it's an, it's just a description. You can type that in as you like there, just as for your use. Uh, but it's then a allowance type um, other is important that that actually is selected, and leave the default rates out um, on there as well. So if I go back now, the other thing that sort of people have been getting caught up with a little bit is entering the JobKeeper subsidy that you actually get back from the tax office. Where do we actually put that? And just um, to round out here, one of the things, um, if we look in our chart of accounts, I would make, I would suggest that you do need to have a separate account called JobKeeper subsidy, perhaps down in your other income, uh, set up as an other income type. And if I just looked at that account, um, it's just other income JobKeeper subsidy. Now. If I just run a report to see uh, what we've done in the past here, when you receive your JobKeeper subsidy, just, just create a deposit. There's no need to create a sales receipt or um, definitely don't use a tax code because you don't want it flowing through to the BAS and also showing up as um, GST turnover. So it's just a matter of banking the money. Um, you've received it from the ATO. It's for JobKeeper subsidy and what particular month it's actually for. Uh, a very similar sort of thing in um, Reckon, uh, pay, sorry, Reckon 1 is just from day to day, we just receive money in and we're receiving money into um, that actual um, 
account. If we look at a transaction here, we can see we've received money from the tax office and we've coded it actually to um, JobKeeper subsidy. If I head on through to there, um, that's just a screenshot. Um, look, just to finish off with, I know we've gone a few minutes over, but there was just so much to cover here. And we, we if you've seen one of these earlier webinars in this series that's been running for the last uh, couple of weeks, um, this is the updated version, that's for sure. There's a whole lot more in this. Um, if you want a copy of the slides, um, please let us know at the end of the webinar. Um, and if you want to reach out to us, by all means, um, do that. But I would suggest though, um, circle back around and get in touch with your Reckon accredited partner. You've got an amazing support person there. In most cases who are a BAS agent, they may not necessarily be your BAS or tax agent, but they know how to get the software doing what it needs to do. So actually, um, if you don't have a Reckon accredited partner, please, we're, um, by all means, we're here to assist. However, I would highly recommend you, you uh, re-engage the support team that helped you uh, with Reckon. There's some contact details for us. Um, feel free to get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. Um, thank you so much for um, you know being on the call today. I know it's a very busy time of the year. I know it can be very confusing as well. I hope this has just helped clarify a few things um, so that you can now go forward and actually uh, plan with some sort of more certainty around where your business is heading um, through this next phase of, of the JobKeeper program. Uh, that's it from me, Andrew. I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Clayton, for that fantastic presentation. Very useful information to help Australian businesses get up to speed and with all the JobKeeper extension details. And thank you everyone for attending this morning's session. As Clayton mentioned, there will be a survey that pops up when we close the webinar. Uh, please take a moment to fill it in to get a copy of the slides or if you'd like to get in touch with Clayton and would also appreciate any feedback that you do have on the session. Thank you again, everybody, and I hope you have a great day.